Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's industry-presented webinar, The Carbohydrate Conundrum, Are Carbs Essential or Obsolete When It Comes to Health, Fitness, and Athletic Performance? A few housekeeping things before we get started. If you do have a question during the webinar, please type it into the question area within the, within the GoToWebinar navigation, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. If your question goes unanswered, don't worry. We'll take all the questions from today's webinar and turn it into a Q&A blog that we'll post on the ACSM website. We also encourage you to join the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter by using the hashtag ACSMWebinar. Today's webinar is sponsored and presented by Potatoes USA. Potatoes USA is the nation's potato marketing and research organization. Based in Denver, Colorado, Potatoes USA represents more than 2,500 potato growers and handlers across the country. Potatoes USA was established in 1971 by a group of potato growers to promote the benefits of eating potatoes. Today, as the largest vegetable commodity board, Potatoes USA is proud to be recognized as an innovator in the produce industry and dedicated to positioning potatoes as a nutritional powerhouse. One continuing education credit, courtesy of Potatoes USA, will be emailed to all participants after the webinar, along with a PDF copy of today's presentation. You should receive the CEC and slides in an email tomorrow afternoon. There is no need to email ACSM asking about CEC credit. Today's webinar presenter is Dr. Catherine Beals. Dr. Beals is an associate professor in the Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology at the University of Utah, where she teaches graduate courses in macro and micronutrient metabolism, sports nutrition, and research methods. Prior to the University of Utah, she held an academic appointment as an associate professor in the Department of Family and Consumer Sciences at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. In addition, Dr. Beals has provided scientific counsel to Potatoes USA for over a decade. Dr. Beals holds a PhD in exercise science and physical education from Arizona State University, is a registered dietitian, and is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine and a certified specialist in sports dietetics. She has published over a dozen articles on disordered eating in the female athlete triad, two books, and several book chapters pertaining to various aspects of sports nutrition. With that, I introduce you to Dr. Katherine Beals. Thank you, and welcome everyone to today's seminar. I'm really glad to uh, be able to cover this topic with you. And um, as I'm sure you all know, there's increasing interest in low-carbohydrate ketogenic diets for improving health, fitness, and athletic performance. Anecdotal evidence and case reports describe weight loss and athletic successes as a result of eliminating or severely restricting dietary carbohydrates. But are these successes because of low carbohydrate ketogenic diets or in spite of them? That's the question that I hope this webinar will answer for you. And um, this slide shows you the outline of what I hope to cover today. And we're going to start with an introduction to the ketogenic diet. And I think an overview is important because there are some misconceptions and perhaps even some confusion regarding the macronutrient composition of a ketogenic diet. It is a very high fat, moderate protein, and very low carbohydrate diet. This slide highlights for you the different percentages of macronutrients in the ketogenic diet. And of note, the ketogenic diet is typically less than or equal to 5% of calories coming from carbohydrate. Conversely, there is about 70 to 75% of calories coming from fat. The remainder, which is about 20%, is coming from protein. So again, I think you can all see that it is a very low carbohydrate, very high fat, and moderate protein diet. Well, the term keto is short for ketosis, which is a state of producing ketone bodies. And just a little bit review of biochemistry for you. Ketone bodies are produced from acetyl-CoA, and this happens when there's a high rate of fat oxidation. Um, and the, this situation would occur during conditions of starvation, carbohydrate depletion, uncontrolled diabetes, prolonged exercise, um, where you're not supplying carbohydrate during the exercise, 
and in response to a very high fat, low carbohydrate, otherwise known as ketogenic diet. Despite the widespread popularity of the ketogenic diet today, it's actually not new. The keto diet has been around for close to a century. It first became popular in the 1920s as a therapy for epilepsy. It was developed to provide an alternative to non-mainstream fasting, which had demonstrated success as a therapy for epilepsy. In 1921, an endocrinologist by the name of Roland Woodyatt noted that three water-soluble compounds, acetone, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and acetoacetate, which are known as the ketone bodies, were produced by the liver as a result of starvation, or if individuals followed a diet rich in fat and low in carbohydrates. Russell Wilder from the Mayo Clinic called this diet the ketogenic diet, and he used it successfully as a treatment for epilepsy. Nonetheless, the ketogenic diet was eventually largely abandoned due to the introduction of anticonvulsant therapies. Although it emerged that most cases of epilepsy could be effectively controlled using these medications, they still failed to achieve epileptic control in around 20 to 30 percent of epileptics. So for these individuals, and particularly children with epilepsy, the diet was reintroduced and remains a technique for managing the condition today. The ketogenic diet was then resurrected um, in the 1970s by cardiologist Dr. Robert Atkins as a method for weight loss. And he published his book that's very well known, The Dr. Atkins New Diet Revolution. Most recently, the ketogenic diet has made its way into the athletic arena, largely due to its endorsement by a couple of well-known and fairly outspoken exercise scientists, Dr. Jeff Volek and Professor Tim Noakes, who's in South Africa. Before examining the existing research on the ketogenic diet as it pertains to health and athletic performance, I think it's worthwhile to do a little review of energy metabolism and substrate utilization during exercise. So we're all on the same page. So, as we know, exercise, particularly prolonged, moderate to high intensity exercise, or what we would call endurance exercise, creates a significant energy demand. Changes in the body's energy demands, from a resting condition to mild exercise to moderate exercise to intense exercise, are accompanied by shifts in the rates of catabolism of the different stored forms of macronutrients, as well as the metabolism of any exogenous macronutrients that are provided. And these shifts are designed to produce ATP. So where does ATP needed to fuel muscle contraction come from? Well, it comes from the metabolism of the different macronutrients, carbohydrate, fat, and to a much lesser extent, protein. There are three metabolic pathways, also referred to as energy systems, whereby the different energy yielding substrates are metabolized to generate ATP. And this slide highlights these energy systems when they're utilized in exercise, as well as the different substrates that are used within the energy system. So the ATP PCR system, also known as the phosphagen system, is used during very high intensity, very short duration exercise. The primary substrate um, for this system is ATP and phosphocreatine. The anaerobic system, also known as the glycolytic system, is used during high intensity short duration exercise of about 20 to 120 seconds. So this is a system that's used um, significantly during high intensity stop and go type sports. The primary substrate, actually the only substrate that can be utilized in this system is glucose. And then last is the aerobic or the oxidative system. This is the system that's used during endurance activities, so low to moderate intensity, long duration exercise. And for this system, the substrates are glucose and fatty acids. 
So again, just to summarize the sources of substrate for ATP generation, you have ATP PCR, glucose that's stored both in the muscle as well as circulating the blood, and then lipids that again can be found in the muscle as well as circulating in the blood. And just a note that under normal circumstances, protein is not a primary or preferred source of energy to use during exercise. Historically, the focus of nutrition for exercise and athletic performance has been on carbohydrate for two reasons. One, endogenous supplies of carbohydrate, that is glucose, are limited, as this slide shows you. And they can be readily depleted during long duration exercise of moderate to high intensity. The other reason that the focus has been on carbohydrate historically when it comes to sport nutrition is that glucose is the primary substrate that's utilized during exercise of moderate to high intensity, where the majority of athletes are going to spend their time as they are training and or competing. Now, there are a number of factors that can affect util fuel utilization during exercise. The most important factor determining which substrate will be utilized um, and the relative percentages of glucose versus fatty acids is exercise intensity. Duration of exercise is a secondary determinant as duration is generally dictated by the intensity of exercise. Nonetheless, when it comes to exercise of a submax intensity, so around 60 to 65% of VO2 max, the substrate availability can have an effect on substrate utilization, although it is a rather minimal one. So I want to focus now on the role of substrate avail availability in terms of affecting what substrate is oxidized during exercise. So as previously mentioned, carbohydrate has been the macronutrient of focus in sports nutrition because it is the primary substrate used to fuel muscle contraction during intermittent high intensity exercise and prolonged moderate to high intensity aerobic exercise. In addition, as I already mentioned, endogenous glucose supplies are limited. So the focus of sports nutrition has been on optimizing carbohydrate availability which is generally defined as having a ready supply of carbohydrate when it is needed. So the hypothesis behind training with high carbohydrate availability is that in doing so, you will maintain optimal glycogen stores, which will provide carbohydrate for the muscle as well as the central nervous system. And this will then support optimal training and improve performance. So what does the research say? Well, the research would support this. Um, research indicates that adequate carbohydrate intake before exercise will top off glycogen stores, and this will lead to improved performance. Research also shows that carbohydrate intake during moderate to high intensity, prolonged and or intermittent exercise will improve performance. And finally, research shows that carbohydrate intake post-exercise enhances glycogen resynthesis and aids in recovery, thereby preparing the athlete for the next training bout or competition. And the references for um, these statements are listed below. There are a number of methods that have been utilized in order to achieve high carbohydrate ability. Uh, sorry, excuse me, availability. Uh, these include consuming adequate carbohydrate daily, ensuring that the am appropriate amount and timing of carbohydrate is consumed before, during, and after exercise. And more recently, there has been interest in training the body to utilize more fat, thereby sparing carbohydrate when it's needed. And this concept has been referred to as training low. So I wanna talk a little bit about the hypothesis behind training low. The hypothesis states that training with low glycogen stores 
will cause the body to shift more to fat oxidation, thereby burning more fat, which will lead to potentially increased losses of body fat, as well as improved endurance performance. So again, the idea is that training with low carbohydrate ability will result in various physiological adaptations, including mitochondrial biogenesis, increase in beta oxidative enzymes, as well as TCA cycle enzymes, which will all lead to increased fat oxidation and improved endurance performance. So that is the hypothesis. Now, there are a number of different strategies that can be used to uh, train low, so to speak, or train with reduced carbohydrate availability. This table was taken from an article on the subject written by Dr. Louise Burke back in 2010. The strategies that I've highlighted in a red box are those that have actually been studied scientifically and that research has been published. So these strategies include chronically consuming a low carbohydrate diet, which would be our ketogenic diet or fat adaptations, or twice a day training um, such that in the second training bout, you are training with low carbohydrate availability. So currently, these are the only two methods of achieving low carbohydrate availability that have been studied with research. So let's look at each one of these and see what the research says. Um, starting actually with the second one, so this study published in 2005 was really the seminal study examining training, training low using that protocol of twice a day training. So I wanna take you through the study. So there were seven subjects and these were untrained men and you can see the age range. The diet that they were provided gave them 3,828 calories per day 70% carbohydrate, 15% protein, and 15% fat. I think we can all agree, looking at this diet, it was not a low carbohydrate diet. This would not qualify as a ketogenic diet. Low carbohydrate availability then was achieved not by consuming a low carbohydrate diet, but rather by training twice a day, such that the second training bout was completed in a low glycogen state, okay? So the training stimulus was five days on and two days off. And this slide, um, I actually pulled the, the schematic from the study itself and it highlights how this worked. So the low group represents those training with low carbohydrate availability. And the high group represents the groups or the group training with high carbohydrate availability. And then the one, two, three, four represents the training days. So as you can see, the low carbohydrate availability group was training twice a day, whereas the high carbohydrate availability group was only training once a day. And the low carbohydrate availability group was doing their second training bout in a carbohydrate depleted state. So what they did is they trained them in the morning, did not allow them to consume much in the way of carbohydrate after that training bout so that when they went into their second training bout, they were training in a low carbohydrate availability situation. Um, I also wanna mention the training because this was sort of an interesting training protocol. And I'm gonna back up to the slide to show you um, kind of what they were doing. So the training consisted of a leg extension exercise. Um, and um, it, it was basically an isokinetic leg extension exercise. So the results. This slide um, simply shows that low glycogen levels were achieved. So if you look at slide B, Specifically, I want you to focus on that. You have the low carbohydrate availability group represented by low, the high carbohydrate availability group represented by high. And you can see that at rest, glycogen stores were similar. 
Um, and then post the first bout, you can see that glycogen stores were depleted in the low group. And then what I really want to focus on is that at the end of their second, so they clearly were going into their second training bout in a low glycogen state, and they completed their second bout in an even lower glycogen state. This slide highlights enzymatic changes and demonstrates that there was a significantly greater increase in enzymes associated with fat oxidation in the group that trained low. Now, what about performance? So first of all, keep in mind that performance was measured by looking at time to exhaustion doing that leg extension exercise. And what they found is that while power output was not significantly different between the groups, although they did both increase as a result of training, as we would expect to see, time to exhaustion was significantly greater in the low carbohydrate availability group, and the total work represented by um, kilojoules was significantly greater in the low carbohydrate availability group. So the authors concluded that training in a low glycogen state increased the synthesis of enzymes involved in fat oxidation. They did not directly measure fat oxidation, and that training low increased time to exhaustion. There were a few limitations to the study, and many of you may have picked these out as I was going along, but let me highlight them for you. The subjects were untrained. These were untrained individuals, so we can't really generalize these results to trained individuals. In addition, the training sessions undertaken by the subjects were clamped at a fixed submaximal intensity for the duration of the training program. And finally, the mode of training, that one-legged isokinetic knee extension exercise, as well as the performance task, submaximal kicking to exhaustion, bear little resemblance to the training undertaken by the majority of competitive athletes. Um, maybe it would translate to a soccer player, but I'm not sure many other sports would, it would translate to. So more recently, um, in 2008, another study was published looking at this training low concept. And um, this study was published by Yao et al. And Yao is a graduate student working under Dr. Louise Burke at the Australian Institute of Sport. And this study sought to correct some of the methodological flaws of the Hansen et al. study. So in this study, um, they utilized 14 competitive cyclists and triathletes, so these were athletes, so the results could be generalized to an athletic population. The training and performance protocol. Um, well, let's look at the performance trial. So it was 60% at 70% VO2 peak, and then they did a 60-minute time trial, and the goal was to complete as much work as possible in that 60 minutes, so much more realistic um, in terms of an actual competitive cycling event. Um, they did three weeks of training where they trained six days a week. And similar to the Hansen study, the low carbohydrate availability group achieved low carbohydrate availability not by consuming a low carbohydrate diet, but by training twice a day. So the low carbohydrate availability group did a 100 minute endurance ride in the morning, then did not replenish glycogen stores after that ride, came back in the afternoon and did a high intensity interval training. And they did this combination every other day. The high carbohydrate availability group um, just alternated days doing the endurance ride and then the next day doing the high intensity interval training. Their diets were rich in carbohydrates, so eight to nine grams per kilogram per day, which is well within the range for a, a competitive cyclist. The results indicated that training low, um, the subjects who trained low, if you look at that first slide, they were unable to achieve the power output during training as those in the high. So you can see the dash line represents the power generated by the low carbohydrate availability group. 
And you can see that compared to the power generated by the high. Despite that, performance times at the end of the uh, study uh, were not significantly different. So training load did not improve performance. So what about the other method of achieving low carbohydrate availability? That is fat adaptation or following ketogenic diet. Again, I want to highlight the fact that ketogenic diets, even when it comes to athletic performance, are really not a new idea. As this slide summarizes, fat adaptation as a potential means for enhancing endurance performance was first studied back in the 1980s, and it was followed up by studies in the 90s and 2000s. The seminal study for fat adaptation in athletes is the Finney et al. study, which was published in 1983. So I want to look a little bit more closely at this study because, again, this is a study that is frequently cited um, both in the literature as well as anecdotally for evidence supporting this um, dietary practice in athletes. So in this study, it was very small. There were five well-trained cyclists. And the protocol was as listed here. So for the first week, the athletes received 35 to 50 calories per kilogram, and it was a high carbohydrate diet. So they were receiving adequate um, carbohydrate during that time. So um, it was also a, um, a fairly moderate to high protein diet, so about 1.75 grams of protein per kilogram. A body weight. And all the athletes did this for one week. And then for four weeks, all of the subjects, all five, were keto adapted. So they all maintained the same calorie intake, but their carbohydrate was dropped to 20 grams or less per day. The measures that were taken were VO2 max and time to exhaustion at a submax intensity. And that's very important. This was done at 62 to 64% of VO2 max, which to put this in perspective, if a competitive marathoner were to run at that level, they would not win the race. Okay, so the results indicated that there was no change in VO2 max um, from the high carb to the keto adapted diet and time to exhaustion was similar. So in fact, there was no significant benefit of following a keto adapted diet. And in fact, even the authors themselves um, stated in their conclusion that these results indicate that aerobic endurance exercise by well-trained cyclists was not compromised by four weeks of ketosis. I don't know about you, um, but, but I am an endurance athlete and I'm not so excited about following a dietary protocol that isn't going to hurt me, but it's not going to help me either. <laughs> so again, just to highlight um, this summary slide, uh, after the Finney study, there were a few more studies that were published um, on the ketogenic or fat adaptation strategy. And you can see by the arrows that, um, in fact, they showed no benefit of that particular diet. Most recently, interest in the ketogenic diet for endurance athletes um, was reignited by the publication of this study by Jeff Volek and colleagues. And again, I want to take you through the study because it's one that's frequently cited as showing a benefit of fat adaptation or ketogenic diets in athletes. So in this study, they identified 20 elite marathon, ultra marathoners, pardon me. And what's important about the study is that it was not a randomized control trial. What they did is they went out and they sought out um, ultra marathoners who self-reported that they were habitually consuming either a high ketogenic or high fat ketogenic diet or a high carbohydrate diet. And then they simply brought these individuals into the lab two different days. First, they did a VO2 max test on them. And then they did a submax run at, again, 64% of VO2 max, which is a submax intensity, for three hours. 
They did not measure performance. All they measured was metabolic responses. And, and actually, the results were not at all surprising. Um, so figure one shows fat oxidation during the VO2 max test for the keto group versus the high carb group. And this is probably the most interesting result of the study. The percentage of maximal aerobic capacity where peak fat oxidation occurred was significantly higher in the ketogenic diet compared to um, the high carbohydrate diet followers. Um, and you know the rest of the graphs and results just highlight the fact that yes, in fact, at submax intensities, fat oxidation was higher in those athletes that were fat adapted. Um, which again is not surprising. The body is is very adaptable, and um, you know, and will learn to adapt to the fuel that you provide. Um, but let me highlight again that these were submax intensities. You're not going to win a marathon running at that pace. What's also interesting, and I find it a little bit um, maybe even comical, um, because um, I actually also have. A, a certificate, a graduate certificate in companion animal nutrition. But the authors of this study liken ultra marathoners and the physiological adaptations that they experience to the keto diet to that of sled dogs. And what I can tell you from my graduate study in animal nutrition is that um, the metabolism of dogs um, is very different from humans. Um, sled dogs are not humans. In fact, dogs are able to metabolize that in a much higher rate than humans. So metabolically, we are very different. This slide just highlights to you um, the other recent studies that have examined um, fat adaptation or ketogenic diets in athletes. Um, and you know, you have this slide in front of you, and you will have it. Um, after this webinar is over, so I don't want to belabor the point, but you can read through the subjects, the methods, and the findings. Again, in most cases, there are no significant advantages to consuming a ketogenic diet. It's not surprising that athletes can adapt to it and they can adjust to it, but that's a very different situation than saying, if I follow this, my performance is going to be significantly improved. And again, as an endurance athlete, I'm unlikely to change my current dietary patterns um, with the, um, the claim that, hey, it's not going to hurt you. The final study I want to cover in, in this area with respect to athletic performance um, was very recently published, and again, it's from Louise Burke's lab and the Australian Institute of Sport. And this study examined 29 elite race walkers, and they were randomly assigned to either a high carbohydrate availability group, and you can see the breakdown there, a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, and you can see the breakdown there, and then 10 subjects were um, assigned to periodize their diet by alternating days between low and high carbohydrate availability. And I'm just going to highlight um, the results for you. Again, you've got um, the reference there, so you can go pull the study if you're interested. But what they found was that three weeks of intensified training um, in these elite race walkers increased peak aerobic capacity independent of the dietary group that they were in. The adaptation to a ketogenic, low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet, however, markedly increased rates of whole body fat oxidation during exercise. Um, but this increased rate of fat oxidation actually resulted in a reduced economy during training, which means that they had an increased oxygen dem demand for a given speed at velocities that translated into real-life race performance. In contrast to training with diets providing chronic or periodized high-carbohydrate availability, adaptation to the low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet impaired performance in these elite race walkers. 
So just to summarize the research on training low and fat adaptation in athletes, short-term training with low glycogen stores will increase the activity of various enzymes in fat metabolism and does promote a relative increase in fat oxidation relative to carbohydrate oxidation at exercise intensities between 58 and 65 percent of VO2 max. So very important at sub-max exercise intensities. Athletes can train and even compete while consuming a ketogenic diet, but research has yet to demonstrate that a ketogenic diet improves athletic performance. And as listed here, there could be some um, disadvantages or some negative effects of consuming a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet that should be kept in mind. In the study out of Louise Burke lab, they saw reduced power output and the ability to train at those higher power levels. Um, other studies have shown increased perceived exertion from athletes that are having to train under conditions of low carbohydrate availability. There's a really nice article published not too long ago that examined the um, notion of perhaps it's not so much glycogen sparing that's going on, but glycogen impairing. Um, possible suppressed immune function, there is some good evidence to suggest that providing carbohydrate, particularly during exercise, may enhance immune function and reduce the incidence of upper respiratory tract infections that tend to plague endurance athletes that are training hard and competing regularly. There may be increased fatigue or an increased risk of overtraining syndrome and a possible risk of injury. I suspect that many of you work more in the area of health and fitness as opposed to athletic performance. So I also wanted to briefly cover the role of ketogenic diets in this space as well. And I want to start with weight loss. Um, there have been a number of studies, um, even clinical trials, that have examined the efficacy of different diets, including ketogenic diets, most notably the Atkins diet, for weight loss. This systematic review, um, which was published a couple of years ago, examined the efficacy of the Atkins diet compared to the South Beach diet, compared to Weight Watchers and the Zone diet, um, with particular focus on sustained weight loss at greater than 12 months. The results showed that head-to-head -head, um, comparisons of the randomized control trials um, showed that really not there wasn't one that was more beneficial than the other. Um, they all contributed to small amounts of weight loss, um, and unfortunately, most of them were associated with the regain of that weight lost initially over 12 months. These two recent review studies probably best sum up the research regarding the ideal diet for weight loss. The first was published by George Bray and colleagues, and George Bray is very well known in the world of obesity and weight control. And uh, I have given you the, the citation so you can certainly pull the study yourself. And they conclude that systematic reviews and meta-analyses indicate that all diets work when adhered to, and that initial weight loss can predict the amount of weight loss to maintain for up to four years. So at least according to this, um, it's adherence to weight loss um, or to a particular diet that seems to be the most um, effective. Another review paper that was published recently by Thorne and Lean states that individuals can lose body weight and improve health status on a wide range of energy or calorie restricted dietary interventions and that differences between these diets are marginal. Optimizing adherence to a particular diet is the most important factor for weight loss. So it doesn't really matter which diet you choose as long as you adhere to it. What about diabetes? Well, research has not specifically examined the ketogenic diet in the dietary management of diabetes. 
but there have been numerous studies that have examined the efficacy of low carbohydrate diets. Now keep in mind that many of these low carbohydrate diets examined for diabetes were also higher in protein, not necessarily high in fat. And the results of these studies indicate that low carbohydrate diets can improve glycemic control in some diabetic individuals. Currently though, the American Diabetes Association makes the following recommendations as I have in this table. That carbohydrate intake from whole grains, a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, legumes, dairy products, with an emphasis on foods that are higher in fiber and lower in glycemic load, should be advised over other sources. They also recommend a variety of eating patterns, including the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, and plant-based diets. The last sort of disease state that I want to examine with respect to the ketogenic diet is cardiovascular disease. And similar to um, what I reported for diabetes, there really is little research that has specifically examined the ketogenic diet that is a high fat, low carbohydrate diet for the prevention and or treatment of cardiovascular disease. However, just like with diabetes, there have been numerous studies that have examined the effects of low carbohydrate diets, generally higher in protein and moderate in fat for heart disease. In general, these studies indicate that low carbohydrate, moderate fat um, and uh, moderate protein diets can lower serum triglycerides and raise HDL levels. However, they often also tend to raise LDL cholesterol levels. So then the question becomes, is this truly beneficial? Um, if you're raising LDL cholesterol, which we know is not healthy, and high LDL cholesterol is a risk factor for heart disease, does um, the decrease in triglycerides and the elevation of L HDL outweigh the negative effect of elevated LDL? And that's something that's still being debated right now. I pulled this from the American Heart Association position stand, and their conclusion, um, strong conclusion, is that lowering the intake of saturated fat and replacing it with unsaturated fats, especially polyunsaturated fats, will lower the incidence of cardiovascular disease. And again, keep in mind that ketogenic diets are high in fat, and many times, unless it's carefully constructed, can be high in saturated fat. So something to keep in mind. All right, so with that, I want to um, sort of summarize everything that we've talked about thus far. Um, starting with athletic performance. And as we said previously, short-term consumption of ketogenic diets can cause alterations in substrate utilization. That is a relative increase in fat oxidation and decrease in carbohydrate oxidation at sub-max exercise intensity. Research does not support a performance advantage of ketogenic diets at this point in time. At this point in time, a high carbohydrate diet remains the evidence-based choice for elite endurance athletes to optimize performance. And this slide just highlights some carbohydrate-rich foods. When it comes to weight management, research indicates that ketogenic diets, specifically though really low carbohydrate, high protein diets, not so much ketogenic diets, offer um, short-term weight loss However, long-term weight loss is not um, greater on low-carbohydrate diets. The most important factor governing weight loss is adherence to the diet. As far as cardiovascular disease and diabetes, research does indicate that lower-carbohydrate diets may provide some metabolic advantages. But the high saturated fat content of the ketogenic diet remains concern. Both the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association recommend following dietary patterns presented in the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans 
And these include the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, and plant-based diets. And with that, I'm going to conclude um, the webinar and send it back over to Nate, who I think is going to entertain questions. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Beals. We do have uh, some questions kind of flying in here through uh, through the toolbar, and I'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, the first one is actually a combination question. Um, two different folks have sort of asked the same thing. Both Deborah and Caitlin have asked um, if the low if, if a low carb diet won't enhance my athletic performance. What about carb loading? Might I see benefits from increasing my carb intake before endurance training? or competition such as a long run yeah um, so yeah so again as I highlighted on um, one of the slides and and I've given you the um, the publications that will support that currently the evidence does suggest that training with high carbohydrate availability and and that's sort of a new term um, the, the old phrase carbohydrate loading is, is sort of passe, and, and now the focus is on carbohydrate availability. And the goal is to make sure that you have carbohydrate available, that is on board, um, before, during, and after your training. And so the recommendations that have been published um, and they were first published in 2011 in an IOC or an International Olympic Committee position stand. And then you'll also find it in the American um, College of Sports Medicine, um, Dietitians of Canada, and Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics position stand for carbohydrate consumption before, during, and after, um, particularly endurance exercise. And so achieving those recommendations of consuming the proper amount of carbohydrate um, in the hours before you go into training as or a competition, consuming the proper amount of carbohydrate during your training or competition based on the intensity and duration of what you're doing, as well as consuming the proper amount of carbohydrate after you finish your training or competition. By following those guidelines, you will achieve high carbohydrate availability and as of right now, the research supports that that is going to be the most effective for optimizing endurance performance. Okay, great, thanks. Another, uh, actually a couple of folks have had a similar type of question, both Todd and Logan are asking, um, has there been any research on the keto diet in regards to strength or resistance training? Yes, um, can, uh, Nate, uh, Nate, I'm not sure, can I, we go back on my slides. Are they still up so I can pull them up? I'm doing it. <laughs> Are the slides still up? Oh, yeah. For, okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. So if you look at this study, there has been one, and it's the Wilson et al. study. So in this chart that I produced for you, um, and again, you can pull that study off of PubMed if you'd like. And in this study, they did look at um, uh, resistance training. And what they saw is that there was a similar increase in strength and a similar increase in lean body mass, as well as a decrease in fat mass in both. So there was no significant difference. Um, although um, in the last two weeks, which is sort of interesting because the last two weeks was when they switched everybody back to a high carbohydrate diet. In the last two weeks, um, the people that were initially on the low carbohydrate ketogenic diet showed a greater increase in lean body mass, but that was after they were switched back to high carbohydrate. So um, that's currently the only study that has been published in um, using a resistance training protocol. Got it. Here's one uh, from Jessica. Understanding the differences in the nutritional needs and differences in the training regimen of an athlete during the off season, is there any research showing significant improvement with body composition? Yeah, so that's that research hasn't been done. Um, looking at the you know doing a high fat that is a ketogenic diet, um, there has been research done looking at higher protein diets. 
for altering body composition. And I think there is some good research to suggest that, um, especially in the off season, if the goal is to alter body composition, doing a moderate carbohydrate, higher protein diet, um, lower fat diet, you know, low to moderate fat diet may be beneficial. But as of right now, there's no research looking at high fat ketogenic diets. And I think that's, that's a really important distinction because, um, you know, as an athlete, I'm training with people, I'm in the gym, I hear them talk, I hear people talk about ketogenic diets. And a lot of them are not truly following a ketogenic diet. What they're following is more of a lower carbohydrate, high protein diet, which is going to have very different um, metabolic effects, physiological effects. Um, it is not the same thing. Okay, let's see, you got one from Mary um, asking about the issue of carbohydrate quality, uh, refined carbohydrates versus unrefined, like grains and high fiber carbs. Are there any studies addressing the differences in the carbohydrate quality? Yeah, unfortunately, there really aren't. I mean, most of the studies that have examined carbohydrate intake before, during, and after exercise, they typically will utilize whole foods, you know, before and after. Um, and, and typically, you know, they, they do more of um, what we would consider a higher quality, you know, they're, they're using fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes um, in those meals that are given before and after exercise. And then during exercise, most of the research has focused on sports products, which I mean, we could say, you know, that sports drinks, gels, goos, um, blocks, chews, um, and even a lot of the sports bars are, in fact, refined carbohydrates. Um, and so, you know, there really hasn't been a study that has looked at um, consuming more of a whole food during exercise relative to a sports food. Um, you know, there, there have been a couple of studies using things like raisins or sports beans to look at different forms. Um, but, you know, most of the research has utilized sports products during exercise. So you really don't have those comparisons. But I think, you know, I think just intuitively we would say, um, you know, before and after exercise, consume those foods that, you know, that we recommend for everybody from a health standpoint, you know, your whole food, whole nutritious carbohydrate rich foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, dairy products. Um, and then again, the focus during exercise has, has largely been because that's what athletes are going to choose. Um, those sports products are developed to be readily digested and absorbed. Um, so they're a ready carbohydrate source for the muscle. Um, but we really don't have those head-to-head -head comparisons of food versus a sports product during exercise. Not yet anyways. Okay. So we've got a couple minutes left. So I'll try to get to, uh, to one or two more. So this one's from David. Um, he said, would it be helpful to continually switch from time to time from different diets, such as the keto diet or high carb, high protein, such that each diet is maintained for a set period of time and then switch to a different diet? It, that's an interesting concept, and it, it, to my knowledge, it hasn't been studied yet. So, um, you know, and, and I'm a firm believer that I let the research guide my recommendations, and I think that's um, I, personally, I think that's the way all of us working in this field should um, let our recommendations be guided um, by the research. So, there really isn't anything. Um, that has examined that. Probably the closest thing, there's been some studies looking at the concept of intermittent fasting for weight loss, but um, as far as athletic performance, is there, um, there, there really isn't any research looking at alternating different diets. I think the closest would be the study um, that I highlighted by Louise Burke that was published last year, um, towards the end of last year, where she had one group periodizing their training between, um, or periodizing their diet, sorry, between um, a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet and the high carbohydrate diet. Um, 
they didn't see in this study, she didn't see any decrements to doing that, but there was no benefit over maintaining the high carbohydrate availability throughout the training period. So that's the closest we have now. Great, and then we've got time for one more, and this one's from Jacqueline. Uh, did any of these studies look at the level of ketone in the body and its effect on the liver or the kidneys? That's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, um, in fact, I'm glad you asked that question because it made me realize it's an oversight that I didn't mention. It, it would seem intuitive that if you're putting somebody on a ketogenic diet, especially if you're relying on self-report of the athletes to indicate that they're following the diet that you're putting them on, or in the case of Volek study, that they're following the diet they say they're following, um, that you would have some sort of physiological measure to ensure compliance to the diet. And to my knowledge, most of those studies, and, and I, I want to go back and review them, um, so I could be wrong, but as far as I know, they didn't actually measure like urinary ketones or blood ketone levels to verify or validate that these athletes are actually following the diet, which would seem to be an oversight. Um, so that doesn't directly answer your question, but um, as far as I know, they have not examined um, you know, any sort of health effects, um, whether it be changes in blood uh, values or even looking at <clears throat> liver function relative to following the ketogenic diets. So I guess that's a long answer to say I don't really know. <laughs> that's fine. Um, <laughs> thank you again uh, very much for your, for your information. It was very um, interesting and helpful to me. And also I wanted to thank uh, Potatoes USA for being the sponsor of today's webinar. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, as a final reminder, uh, an email with a link uh, with a CEC along with a recorded version of today's webinar and the slides from Dr. Beals uh, will be sent to you guys in an email tomorrow afternoon. So this concludes the webinar. I hope everybody enjoyed it and have a great afternoon.